I think we all that are familiar with the Old Testament, and especially the book of Genesis, remember the account of Sarah, Sarai at this time, and Abram, and Sarai's handmaid, Hagar. And then, of course, all that happened regarding the birth of Ishmael. Sarai was dealt with rather harshly, or rather Hagar was, was by Sarai. And so she fled from Sarai's sight, her presence. And we find that she was reassured by an angel. And when she was reassured, Hagar made the statement that I don't know whether it was behind the fellow that wrote this song we just sang or not, but it certainly could be. Hagar stated what is really a profound truth in verse 13 of Genesis 16. Thou God seest me. Thou God seest me. She may have hidden from Abram and from Sarai, but she was not hid from the all-seeing eye of God. God sees man from a vantage point none other can attain. It's one reason we should never think of God as a man. We need to understand that he sees all our deeds. He knows all our thoughts. He knows all our purposes and motives. He searches the heart, which is the fount of all good and all evil thoughts. Acts 1 verse 24. As the psalmist said, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. And then he said, there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. Psalm 139, verses 1 and 4. When we think about the attributes of God, we'll refer to the omniscience of God, which means He knows all that is the object of knowledge. Sometimes that's so... Uh, Stiff in its definition, I don't know that we really appreciate that, but what we just said in the introduction to this lesson, Thou God seest me, ought to make it very practical and personal every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of all our lives. Man cannot hide from God. At all times we must be acutely aware of that great fact. He knows all our goings. He knows all of our comings. He beholds our every act. In Proverbs, we read in chapter 15, in verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Therefore, since God always sees us, then wouldn't it seem that we should look to God, our Creator, who knows all that there is about us? It is not at all disconcerting to know He watches us, but there's a big if here. If we are also looking to God, looking to His Word, seeking to know His truth, striving to put it into practice in our thoughts and actions. The psalmist by inspiration declared, I have set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Psalm 16 and verse 8. The child of God then must maintain a sharp consciousness of God's abiding presence. Proverbs 34, verse 21, For His eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all things. Now the point we want to make to help us is that are we conscious through the day and all of our doings and goings and comings that God is so very near? 
as it were, he is silently observing all we do, and he's hearing all that we say. But the question comes up, why would man try to hide from God in the first place? Well, it's because of his sins. It's because of the reality that he knows he's broken God's will. And you say, where does such a thought or feeling or emotion come from within the mind of man that he would be guilty, if you please? First of all, it testifies to the fact that God made us in such a way as to be conscious of such things. As to be aware of such things. How could you be aware if you weren't capable of being aware? If you didn't have a conscience, how would it work? God has placed eternity in all of us. It was after that they had eaten the forbidden fruit that Adam and Eve hid in the garden. They hadn't done that before. It was when he had denied the Christ that Peter went out and wept all alone. It was when he had failed to do the bidding of God that Jonah sought to hide in the hold of the ship, trying to run from God in the first place. But all of that is, is emptiness, all of that is worthlessness, all of that is folly. The scripture reads, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4 and verse 13. I say again that to those who love the Lord with all their heart and know that their whole duty is to keep his commandments, having feared him with the proper awe and respect that is due God because he's God, it's comforting to know that someone knows. As we sing in the old song also, Jesus knows and Jesus cares. How could there be a statement that brings comfort to faithful Christians under duress and persecution like there is in the book of Hebrews when he says we have a high priest that can be touched by in infirmities. That he has been tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. That he ever liveth to make intercession for us on our behalf. That he is the only mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. For one who trusts in God, that is a very comforting thought. When in prayer you can pour your heart out to God and know that He understands, He cares. God, you see, didn't just intellectually know because of what omniscience means. But God chose to know our plight experientially. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the apostle said, Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He wrote that in verse 14 of John 1, after having said in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made. Now think about it for a moment. Here's the executor of the Father's will, the second person of the Godhead. Through Him, God creates all things in the world. He creates man. Then man sins and corrupts the whole creation. And yet He who was the executor, He who did the actual creating, decides to become one of those men and enter His creation that man fouled up by sin and brought all the misery that's in the world. But He says, I'll go there. And I will live as a man because I will be a man. And I will undergo all the temptations man undergoes and I won't transgress my Father's will because my sustenance, my meat, my, my food is to do my Father's will. As he said, I do always those things that please Him. So he would do that. Imagine having a house worth a million dollars built with the best furniture and the best builders, etc., etc., and then a bunch of hooligans come in and tear it all up. How would you feel entering that house at that time? That's what Jesus did. And yet He came to save those who allowed the hooligans in. He came to save those who by their own will sinned and separated them from God. So when you think about 
God knowing all that the object of knowledge, and then you think about the experiential knowledge of becoming a part of the whole thing and experiencing what we experience. But because He didn't sin, He could offer His body a sacrifice on the tree and shed His blood to purchase us from our sins. <coughs> Psalm 121.3 reads, He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Don't you like that? He that keepeth thee will not slumber. We've all had times, and especially in times of war when soldiers are on guard duty, you know, if they go to sleep, they can be shot. That's how serious that is because of what it means to guard and to warn if the enemy's coming. But we have one who will not slumber. So these things are a great comfort to those who love the Lord and keep His commandments, who are seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things should be added unto him. God sees us in a different light than does our, our friends, and our family, or our loved ones. They're always going to try to put the best light on what we do, sometimes to a terrible fault. Reputation and influence can be a factor in how people view us. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the passage reads, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We often judge by how a person appears, outward appearance, or by his education, or maybe his culture, or some way he's been involved in this, that, and the other that's given him in the eyes of men great prestige. Maybe it's even his clothing. Certainly his wealth, etc., etc. But know this, God does not judge men that way. God's judging what he sees in the inward most parts of man. The real you, the heart, the spirit, the inward man. When the Son of God performed miracles, men believe because they were designed to say this man's from God this man is who he claims to be in John 2 verses 24 and 25 but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man so Jesus could infallibly judge righteous judgment, not on the basis of just the fruit born, you see, but on the basis of knowing the motives, purpose, and intents of the heart of every person. Because you can have the intent of evil and do a good thing. But God knows when that's the case. And He knows those who have good intentions and thus do God's will because they intend to. They spend the time studying the Bible to know God's will and to do it. In other words, He knows why we do what we do. God sees us in our everyday walk of life. Maybe we would do well to sing that song we sung a few times a day. All along the road to the soul's true abode, there's an eye watching you. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake. There's an eye watching you. We should remember that God watches our business transactions, our quest for entertainment, whatever that may be. He knows all about our efforts to serve Him. He knows about all of the mistakes, and He knows about all of the good intentions that turned out to be bad situations, though we meant well. He knows about our efforts to learn the Bible and put it into practice. He knows when we stumble and fall and get up again. There's nothing hidden from Him. So ponder what this consciousness of God's presence would do. The husband may be far away from his wife, but he's never far away from God. The son or the daughter may be separated from home from parental care and guidance. But God's always there. 
Christians may be far away from the saints and with away from their fellowship and their encouragement. But God's always there. God still sees. God still knows. In my travels throughout the world from time to time, being far, far away from these United States, I never had the thought that I was any farther or nearer to God than I was when I was here. Because He was there before I ever got there. And He goes with you every step of the way. There is no realization that will keep one true to right principles and conduct more than this. Thou God seest me. God will also see us for what we truly, actually are when we stand at the judgment bar of God on high. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. We see, it can't be talking about secret thing from God because there's no secrets from God. He has to be talking about what we think are secret from others and may be secret from others, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes, I say, 12, 14. Irresistibly, we are drawn to the judgment of God. Does your mind throughout the day think of the day you stand before God in judgment to give an account of the deeds done in the body? How often does it cross your mind? For we're rushing quickly toward that time. Every one of us since this time last week are much closer to our leaving this world and the end of the world for that matter. All lines lead to that most important engagement. And who's there? Why, it's God waiting on us. But you see, He's always been with us. He's always known us. And for the faithful child of God, what a source of comfort that is. Because Jesus pictures what that will be like. Those on His right hand representing the saved who love the Lord kept His commandments, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Do we want to serve God now? Well, I ask that question, then in your answering it, well, God already knew, didn't He? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 There's not going to be any pleading your case or some sort of deal made. It'll all be on the basis of the good or bad we've done. So we must fully realize that every step in life leads to the final and complete judgment of God. Every time we gather together to worship God, when we read our Bibles at home, whatever we do that's enjoined upon Christians because we are Christians and it's Christ-like, all really points to the day when we shall stand before the judgment bar of Christ. Eternal life hangs in the balance. And our conduct in this life determines our final destiny. There is no second chance. What we do here determines where we shall be in eternity. Romans 14, 12 simply reads, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We are prone to pass the buck or attempt to. There's no passing of the buck with God. That's the reason when the, when the truth of the gospel is preached to you, you should receive it as that, from the standpoint of this applies to me and nobody else. It doesn't make any difference what this one's doing or that one's doing or not doing or what. It makes all the difference what I'm doing, what I'm thinking what my motives are, what my purposes are, what my plans are, how am I living right now? 
in harmony with the teachings of the New Testament or not. It's all it comes down to. So we should really, when we hear the gospel preached, when we're reading the Bible at home, wherever we're hearing the Word of God presented, just simply put other people out of our minds and say, does this apply to me? My grandfather on my mother's side had a great relationship with me and I him, but, but he never obeyed the gospel. He never was interested in the truth. And you couldn't talk with him about it. He never would become angry or anything like that. He, he just wouldn't talk with you about it. I think a couple of times once I reached adulthood, I had a chance to say something to me about it. And I asked him, Pop, what's going to happen when you die? He first said, well, there's a place in the cemetery for me. And that was the end of that. And some time passed, and I couldn't tell you how long. I had a chance again. It seemed good to try to broach the subject. And I said, uh, what's going to happen to you when you die? And all he would say was, I'll be with my mother. And that's as far as our discussion ever got right up through my first two or three years or so of preaching. Now, he would come hear me preach once or twice or three times maybe. But to him, it was just, oh, look what my grandson's accomplished. It wasn't a matter of I'm coming to hear the truth preached. It may be something I need. It may be something I'm heard. I, I never knew that when it came to him. And that causes me to wonder how many other people sit and listen to the word preached but it's all for the wrong reason it's not hearing it from the standpoint of those people on the day of Pentecost when they heard the gospel preached and by the way they were devout people already they would come there to do what they thought God wanted them to do under the law of Moses they were, they were devout the scripture says same word in Greek that's applied to Cornelius. These were dedicated people to what they knew. But they weren't there. That is, he wasn't there like they were when they heard things that raised questions that caused them, men and brethren, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? We ought to be listening to the gospel preached, the Bible read, our own personal study of it, the discussions of it we're in hither or yon, with the idea of what does that do for me in my service to God? Well, God sees us. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. It'll make a difference in all that we do if we will receive personally, intimately, the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. I want to close with this. I remember long years ago being around the preachers that I magnified in my mind as stalwarts of the faith and Bible knowledgeable people. And uh, it would frighten me to think that I would stand up and try to preach <laughs> when they were in the audience. And yet, you know, I, I learned that they were the best people to have in the audience because they'd been where I'd been at one time in their life. Their heart was with me. They were cheering me on. And that's the way we ought to think about it. Everybody is wanting, if they're of the right attitude, all of us to succeed. Look at how Hebrews 11 ends we're surrounded by great cloud of witnesses as if they're in the stadium watching us run and fight the fight of faith running the race is set before us and they're urging us on they don't want us to lose and certainly God does thou God seest me if you're not a child of God, why let this afternoon go by and not become one and be redeemed? Have the blood of Christ applied to you to wash all your sins away in your belief in Christ, repentance of your sins, confession of faith, and in the waters of baptism, contact the blood of Christ shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins.
a child of God, are you walking in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship one with another and with God? If you have stepped out of the way, if you have sinned, if you violated the Lord's will as a child of God, thou God seest me. So repent of those sins, confess them, and humbly from the heart pray God for forgiveness. We have but this one time through. Who's waiting at the end? Thou, God, seest me. You're subject to the invitation. We invite you to come before we stand and sing.